Well, 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 well. You're very welcome along. Another day, another drug scandal. We'll get to that in just a couple of minutes, but you might notice that we've got this rather imposing large ball here sitting on the desk. Not that we're generally intimidated by large balls or anything, Owen, but this one's pretty intimidating. It, I haven't touched it yet, but it looks like it's made of wood. Is that true? Knock on wood. It is wood, right, okay. I thought it was just kind of like a nice finish to an actual ball of whatever balls are made of leather. Um, yeah, well, not heavy. <laughs> it's the first time I've actually. It was. It came in a box. It's a very special piece of Irish sports history memorabilia, and um, not that he's pushing his book or anything. But uh, our colleague has uh, kindly. It. It turns out anybody who makes it to the top level of sport is ultra competitive. Because earlier on this week, we uh, we were very kindly donated a pair of boots that were used in the. Um, Three test series against the Lions by Conor Murray. I was like, mm -hmm. wow, this is amazing. I mean, Andy Lee's belt is great. He did say on air, though, it was one of the belts that you wouldn't really bring down the gym because you're a bit embarrassed by it. Mm -hmm. Which was, you know, we still were like, wow, it's amazing. It's a piece of sports memorabilia. And then this is like actual boots worn against the All Blacks. And then this, this might have upped the ante even further. Well, I thought it was a ball kicked against any team considering it's made of wood, but I'm looking forward to the backstory uh, about this ball because there's no spoilers just yet, anyway. No, you can just about make out that there is green marker. Green is obviously a bit of a, it's a bit of a clue there. Green and Kevin Kilban, bit of a, bit of a clue there. Yeah, the, if you can see the logo on the ball as well, it might be a bit of a giveaway. But, uh, but you probably I, I don't think it's it quite visible. Away. I'm going to walk up to the camera a little bit later on and show you some of the, um, the names that are scrawled on this ball. But uh, yeah, anyway, so that is definitely part of what we're going to talk about a little bit later on in the show. Um, Kevin Kilban is going to join us. We booked this last night, thinking. Um, well, two things. We thought that Kev was going to be able to join us in the studio, and then late last night he's like, oh, balls, I'm on Caribou Cup duty. So he's actually in the airport. He's going to be Skyping in from there mm. um, on his way to whatever game he's doing tonight. Maybe the Arsenal game? Could be. Arsenal West Ham. Um, and we also booked it uh, thinking it was going to be a routine victory for Everton. When it was 1-0 Swansea, I was like, oh, Jesus, what are we going to talk about now? But luckily they came back. They thrived. Yeah, the and university. just thriving is a thing that Everton are doing right now. I mean... Wayne Rooney, Gilfie Sigurdsson, completely incomparable to the players they were two months ago, getting the best out of them, Big Sam, which is what he does. I guess we've had a little bit of an argument on this show before about yeah, whether or Sean not... Dyche is way better manager than uh, Big Sam. Well, no, that's obviously not what I think. That's totally what you said. I think Sean Dyche was a bit of a better fit for Everton than Big Sam is. And, you know, you're, you're probably you're wrong, gonna, it's okay. You're probably going to be on your high horse this morning. Oh, they've got 10 points from a possible 12. Therefore, the argument is dead. The argument isn't dead. Let, let, give it time, give it time, and we will see this thing go a little bit pear-shaped for Big Sam. We don't actually live in an alternative universe, though, where Sean Dyche has got the Everton job, so we can't compare and contrast how much of a flop he would have been if he'd gotten it. But anyway, uh, so that's one of the things that we have coming up for you today. Also coming up, we're going to be talking about the best sports books of the year. We had a conversation about it last week, and we had um, some clips from the weekend to play in, but today we also have um, the author of a brilliant new Muhammad Ali. I mean, everybody thinks they've read everything there is to read about Muhammad Ali, but there was some stuff in Jonathan Ige's book, Muhammad Ali, A Life, that we weren't um, totally familiar with. No, the philandering of Mr. Ali is something that I don't think many people are that aware of until you read this book. I'm sure there's pl plenty of viewers out there who have picked up the book because if you haven't read Thomas Hauser, Muhammad Ali, His Life and Times, then... You should. But you should, first of all. Yeah. But second of all, you haven't read any, anything comprehensive of Ali's life. First of all, this is an outstanding comprehensive study of Ali as a character. But the reason why that is, is because of the flaws in Muhammad Ali's character, particularly his relationship with women and his views towards women. And as I say, his philandering, the way essentially a number of his wives helped him cheat outside his marriage to have extramarital affairs. Yeah. They acted as his pimps, essentially. Why they did that? Well, you know, there was uh, a couple of instances of violence from Ali's uh, side, which I'd never heard of before. So there's multiple layers to this thing as to the motives behind it and the actions that happened in his relationships. Uh, of course, the, the book deals with Muhammad Ali, the boxer, and the, the brain injuries that he suffered, but uh, this is certainly something new that Ig has got his hands on, so it's an excellent book, and we're going to spe be speaking to him a little bit later on. All right, let's get to the main story of the day. There is a drug scandal, according to the Daily Telegraph. They went and um, conducted a, a sting over a number of months uh, around the coach really, of Justin Gatlin. Justin Gatlin is uh, a minor character in this story, but certainly he is the front cover of The Telegraph this morning. Gatlin embroiled in New Athletics doping scandal is their headline, and they have four pages in the inside. Uh, they have linked an agent to him, and they've also got Dennis Mitchell, who is Gatlin's coach. Um, and uh, just to, to fill in some of the details on this, 
Effectively, what happened was the Telegraph purported to be producers for a Hollywood film about an athlete. They said that they wanted to get somebody who could train their athlete to appear as if he was a genuine a world-class Olympic athlete. And so they went to this guy, David Wagner, who is an agent, and uh, they offered him a quarter of a million. Or maybe, I don't know if they offered him, but certainly he quoted them a figure of a quarter of a million to get them HGH and uh, EPO variants and to embed them in the uh, Dennis Mitchell slash Justin Gatlin camp and train him up to be an athlete or possible as an athlete. So I don't know, whoever the modern day Daniel Day-Lewis is was going to be this character and uh, take the drugs like your man did for um, the, the program. Didn't he take EPO? The guy who was playing Lance? He did. Really? Yeah, he I took, didn't know that. Yeah, he, he got in character for it. There's a, a great uh, Lance and him podcast where they're geeking out about each other's uh, drug use and your man's like, oh, I can't really go into too much detail about <laughs> Look this. Look how big your veins are. I, I think it's highly ironic that um, that Wagner sits down with this producer, a so-called producer, and is like, yeah, that's totally understandable. You want uh, an EPO variant and you want HGH just to look a little bit better, just so those veins pop a little bit more. This is authentic Hollywood right there. Yeah. I think it tells you a lot about the sporting landscape that he sits down and is like, yeah, I buy that. Yeah. Um, I mean... You kind of pays your money and takes choice about these type of stories. Like, if I came in and offered you a quarter of a million, are you going to tell me whatever you need to tell me to get that quarter of a million? Well, that's the thing. That'll be the defense, certainly from Wagner's side of things. That is like, oh, I wasn't really implicating Justin Gatlin. I was just saying it. Uh, and I gave, I gave him 10 grand on the understanding I'd get a quarter of a million. That still leaves me 240 grand. He goes and does a couple of meetings, and you're like, wow, that's Justin Gatlin. And then you get to say, I trained with Justin Gatlin for this film. Yeah. The, like, what's the. the I, I must say that the, the power of the punch is a little bit softened by the fact that it's Justin Gatlin. It's just like, oh, Justin Gatlin does drugs. Wow. I did, didn't see that one coming, but I suppose it is the, the whole. Can you call it a relapse when it comes to performance enhancing drugs? He's suggesting that certainly Gatlin has relapsed. Of course, we are not suggesting at all that Justin Gatlin has done anything uh, untoward uh, at any point ever in his career. So uh, we said those two times that yeah. obviously uh, he's got failed um, tests in his past. Now, like if you look back at the stuff that Gatlin has actually done, there is a prescription for Ritalin before he gets popped the first time. That isn't um, like anyway. I don't really want to. I'm not here to go to bat for Justin Gatlin, but um, athletics is screwed and here is somebody who is deeply embedded in athletics basically saying athletics is screwed and everybody is is still cheating and everybody has historically been cheating and I don't know if there's anything new in this story that's actually going to make anybody stand up and go oh my god I can't believe somebody this close to athletics is so open about what's happening in athletics there's no actual proof that he has access to any of this stuff they say that to prove his bona fides he emails them um uh uh, synthetic HGH syringe and um, a vial with a name on it. But you Google that vial and it's like really easy to get a picture of it. Like the, the drug in question here is Peptide Pro's Frag 176191. That's the one. Um, that just off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, but like that's the interesting stuff I find, just particularly when you open the Telegraph and you see the story and then you see a column from Dick Pound and he's making the point, uh, drug testing has come a long way, we're now up to speed, we're now getting inside information from pharmaceutical companies who are willing to give WADA the jump on these guys because they're tipping them off. Well, that's unbelievably important. And so the paper, the parent stuff I hadn't actually got a chance to look at yet. So what's he saying? Well, he is making that point that I just made, uh, that they're essentially getting a jump on the athletes. But I'm not necessarily true that's, uh, sure that's true because... First of all, in the piece, you have Robert Wagner saying that the athletes are willing to take risks. He refers to them potentially growing a third leg at some yeah. point because th that would suggest to me that these drugs haven't exactly gone through the testing process. They're getting them extremely early before they get to the clinical stage. And it seems to me, from what Dick Pound is saying, is that WADA are getting their hands on it right before the stage where they go into the clinics and they actually get tested. So these athletes Too are late. taking huge risks and they're taking them just after they've come off the production line years and years, potentially decades, before they actually go and get tested. Uh, so that's, that's a crucial information there, but also this idea of masking agents and synthetic drugs. First of all, that the synthetic drugs aren't testable, they aren't detectable. And second of all, that these masking agents work and they still work. It's, it's the oldest trick in the book. Well, certainly back into the 90s, you know, you take your EPO and then you take another substance to mask the, any effects of the EPO. And sometimes the masking agent might actually be detected. At this point now, you've got synthetic drugs where it's all put in together and this synthetic product 
isn't isn't testable at all. It, it isn't detectable. So I, from from what Pound is saying. He is, of course, giving the whole PR line. Of course, he's come from a WADA background that things are okay. He is admitting that there's a long way to go, but I think we're a much longer way away from the final destination than Pound actually realises. Yeah, I'd say he's got a fair handle on how far we are away. This is this is an unwinnable war. You're never actually going to stop people taking drugs. And what you need to do, as Ross Tucker would always say, is um, finance a group of people whose job it is to go and find out what is actually in the marketplace and then finance a bunch of people whose job it is to test for that. So you have to do analysis, investigation, and you need whistleblowers and you need to encourage people to come forward. So in some sense, this might be relatively useful in bringing a bunch of people along with the notion that the uh, testers are miles behind. But it's stuff that if you've paid any attention, you already know. Like all the way back, we were just chatting about this off air, all the way back to the Balco scandal, there was um, Victor Conte is the guy who runs Balco Laboratories in San Francisco and he turns a bunch of relatively good athletes into world-class athletes uh, who win Olympic medals and become world famous and get really rich. There's a falling out with an individual who gets a sample of what he's giving his athletes and sends it to a drug testing agency and says, oh, you want to start testing some of Victor Conte's guys for this stuff. Mm. And so they take it, analyze it, start testing Victor Conte's guys for it and go pop, and the whole thing explodes. He falls and goes to prison. But what that was, was uh, THC, which was a synthetic drug, which was basically a bunch of really good drugs, mildly changed in very rudimentary fashion. And it's exactly what uh, Wagner is saying is happening today. So the prototype is you get a drug that really works, you alter it a little bit, you do the, take that, see if it has any impact, it ha- turns you into a superstar, and then you test it to see if you can actually, mm. it's detectable. It's not detectable, away you go and you never get caught, and you win loads of goals. Like the common denominator there when it comes to all the big scandals that have come to light over the past few decades is that there has been somebody willing to come forward with this information. You look at Balco, you look at Festina, you look at Lance, yeah, it, like you look at this investigation story, it, it is to do with a whistleblower or a sting or something of, that, of those sorts. And even when it comes to a lot of these stings, the end product is pretty harmless, to be honest. Like, is anything actually going to happen as a result of this? No, I think their defence is pretty obvious. Well, it, it, so Mitchell's been sacked by Gatlin. Has, is that what, has that happened or has just... Certainly Wagner has. Uh, Wagner is like, how can they sack him if he didn't really work for him? Well, that's the thing. Like, like the other thing just about Wagner, and you mentioned the quarter of a million that was put on the table here, the amount of money that is involved in doping far outweighs the amount of money involved in anti-doping. And as long as one side is weighted more financially than the other, that side is going to win. And the other point that you were making about somebody has to come forward in all of those scandals is that no one has ever really been caught by testing positive. Mm. Like, uh, dope testing is an intelligence test and if you can pass a simple IQ test you're going to be able to dope properly. Like the science and the way Dennis Mitchell described it doesn't really sound like he fully understands oh. exactly what's going on when it's like um, um, whatever whatever language he was using around DNA and I was like that's not really how that science works I don't think Dennis but like you've got the basic substitute one thing in and it changes but anyway um, he seems to have managed to pass the intelligence test all, most of his life. Just in case you don't know who Dennis Mitchell is, though, uh, the Telegraph have this very handy um, thing on their website. An Olympic gold medalist, two-time world champion, Dennis Mitchell may be best remembered for the bizarre excuse he gave when he was caught with high levels of testosterone in his blood. He tested positive in 1998 and then blamed the effects of drinking beer and having sex with his wife four times on her birthday because she deserved a treat. Now, that's ridiculous enough, but the best part is... His excuse was accepted by the USA track and field, who were like, ah, oh, that's what happened. That's why you were uh, massively over the limit of testosterone. <coughs> Luckily, the IAAF said no, and they banned him for two years. So the uh, US track and field really come out of that one smelling of roses. Um, and who's this guy, Wagner? Uh, he's got a really interesting backstory. He's an Austrian. Um, uh, he's seen life from both sides of the tracks, and that's a pun. After following his father into Austria's national railway, he turned his hand to sports journalism. I mean, right there, you know that this guy's dodgy, right? Uh, but anyway, eventually uh, turned to managing some of the world's most famous track and field stars. Basically, there was a gold rush to try and become the agent of all of the Eastern Bloc athletes at the fall of the Berlin Wall. And so he drove a lot of wine into East Germany, which he um, gave to a bunch of East German athletes in 1988 when the wall fell signed them all up and became their agents and uh, has never looked back. Yeah, it's very interesting when you look at his repertoire and the athletes he's worked with. Obviously, you've got Gatlin, you've got Ben Johnson, but then like 
you've got athletes who there has never been any kind of whispers of any negativity about. You've got the likes of Colin Jackson and Denise Lewis, both from the UK, uh, involved with this guy, which is very damaging to them. I'd be very interested to see what they have to say because essentially their clean reputation is being challenged massively by the, their association. Of course, the Telegraph said it. Like and they correctly point out that there has been never any suggestion that these two people have been involved in anything like that. The most interesting thing about this person is that he's been involved with a training academy in Jamaica. Mm. Like we know how unbelievably awful the the testing procedures are in Jamaica. Their anti doping agency is was anyway uh, close to non-existent for yeah. a period there in the last decade. So particularly just before the Olympics in London, exactly, which was hugely successful for them. So. Robert Wagner and his involvement with Jamaica, I, I would be very surprised if this wasn't the start of a, of a deeper bit of digging by the Telegraph or by some other organisation with, with a lot of money to, to sting somebody in Jamaica because I would say there's a lot of people willing to talk in that country. Yeah, you hope so. I mean, I, I, again, like it doesn't feel like there's anything massively new here and it also feels like it's hard to trust people when they're being offered massive amounts of money to explain how they're going to do something for you where there are no repercussions, like it's not illegal. I mean, okay, so it's like you're getting a prescription for somebody that they don't fully deserve. It, that might be illegal technically, but no one's ever gonna go to prison for, uh, for giving somebody who's an actor a bit of HGH mm -hmm. and a bit of EPO to train for a role. Like, it's just not gonna happen. We know it's not gonna happen. So, um, I don't know. What, what do you think? Is this like, were you, when you saw this last night or this morning, were you like, wow, this is amazing? Or was it a bit of, oh, okay. I think, I think it's very, very interesting on the Gatlin side of things that he's kind of been pulled into this role again, as in, was the investigation carried out because they knew Gatlin would be the, the star at the end that they could put on the front page, it's like Gatlin has done this thing again, or we're pretty confident that he has been involved with dodgy dealings once again for the third time in his career. It just seems very interesting that that might be the end product. I think, though, they had a tip-off about Robert Wagner and then Gatlin ends up being the guy that he mentions and it ends up being the star that they're going to put on the front of the newspaper. I think it could be the start of something very, very big. Like, how much of a chatterbox is Robert Wagner? Is he now going to throw a lot of people under the bus? I kind of doubt he will, to be honest. Like, unless uh, another media organisation actually does come up with a quarter of a million and more that uh, a businessman from Austria can actually do with, because I would say he's got a lot more money off uh, all the people he's given or dealt with under the table, let's say. I think he's fine, so I'm not really sure there's going to be any further fallout from this. Let's run you through the rest of the newspapers. As ever, if you want to get in touch with us, you can comment uh, at Off The Ball on Twitter, facebook.com forward slash Off The Ball. We're live there. You can always comment on the uh, Facebook stream, and you can also get us on youtube.com forward slash Off The Ball. So the order of the newspapers, we've obviously already brought you the Telegraph. Going to move to the Examiner next? Yeah, big story on the front of the Examiner, 840 grand is what Montpellier are expected to offer a CJ Stander. Uh, 840,000 a year reads the headline Montpellier's stunning bid to woo CJ Stander and that is one hell of a bid right there from Montpellier and you would expect it if they're willing to go to 840 they're willing to go to the big 1000000. Um, so that one remains to be seen because 840,000 a year there is no way Munster can match that. So the figure for Omani was 400 or 450? Mm. The figure for Tyke Furlong, according to the Herald today, is 100 grand more than that. It's 550 a year. There's no way that they're going to pay CJ Stander. Um, there's no way they're going to pay CJ Stander more than Peter O'Mahony. Not a hope. So you've got to assume that 4, 400 or 440 is the limit for CJ. And then I think there are probably some incentives beyond that, like if they were to win a World Cup or whatever. So if you're CJ, do you go and spend three years in Montpellier for 2.4 million and think... Well, that buys me a lot of uh, vegetables in South Africa. He's a vegetable farmer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't realise that. I just thought he would go on like a vegetarian diet or whatever after he retired, and that was just sustainable for life. But yeah, like it's hard to turn that down. It's yeah. I, I find the discourse around uh, CJ Stander and the difference between that and the discourse around Peter O'Mahony very interesting because if you had eight hundred forty thousand a year on the table for Peter O'Mahony, it seemed that people were like, oh, fair enough. He's got a family. He's he's got to sustain them. Whereas with CJ Stander, everybody's like, screw you, CJ. We gave <laughs> we you, you. A, a test status, and uh, now you're now you're just leaving us and going to take your money because you're you just see dollar signs in your eyes. Like, CJ Stander has a family too, and this would very much sustain them. Like, he would make as much in three years as he would in six years at Munster on money like this, yeah. at least. Now, the only thing is that there's a possibility that Munster can provide other aspects of, like, post-career stuff that maybe you don't get in somewhere like Montpellier. Having said that, the weather in Montpellier is absolutely amazing compared to the howling winds and the, uh, and the rain in Ireland. 
I was going to say Munster, but it's all over Ireland, so there's no point. It's not, that's not a dig at Munster. Right, on to the independent. Um, this uh, story in the bottom there, uh, sorry, is about Kean Healy potentially being cited and uh, Mikel Arteta as a possible successor to Arsene Wenger. He's obviously assistant at Manchester City, but their lead is that... Um, the uh, Dublin commercial juggernaut is rolling on. 1.6 million from sponsors offsets rising costs of Dublin teams. So it costs Dublin more to run their teams, but actually the brilliant job that they're doing in um, getting sponsorship, it's Mossy Quinn's team basically, has uh, managed to offset that and uh, it's all systems go for them so they can continue to invest and they're getting support from the um, commercial sector to help with their efforts. Let's show you the front of the Irish Times sports pages this morning. They're going with Everton, Rooney and Sigurdsson seal comeback win to clip Swansea and City to give De Bruyne a new deal. That's a story that's carried in a lot of places this morning. Kevin De Bruyne about to sign a massive new lucrative deal to keep him at Manchester City. We've also got Wenger putting faith in latest crop of Arsenal youngsters. That's ahead of their Carabao Cup tie against West Ham. The uh, Times Ireland edition uh, also have a Kevin De Bruyne story to get a new 200 grand deal from City. 200 grand for De Bruyne, I mean, like in today's market, you kind of think he's probably a 350 man. Definitely. So maybe 200 grand a week. I mean, it's ridiculous, obviously, I was talking like that. But yeah, and then that story on the side of it, um, Scott Brown has been forced to come out and insist that Celtic have not been found out having been beaten 4 0 by Hearts at the weekend after 69 games unbeaten. So you can imagine the stupid question that was like, oh, bleh, you're crap now, Hearts just beat you 4-0. Like, yeah, it's the first time in over a year and a half we've lost a game. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of an insult to the intelligence of Scottish footballing people that it would have taken 69 games to find a team out. <laughs> no, I, I think Celtic were just better than all those teams for almost 70 games, and that's what happened. They had one off day, although the form has been dipping for sure. They, pro they could have lost after 68 as well. Um, our, um, our Twitter feed did look like it had been taken over by Rob Gronkowski yesterday when the 69 games thing oh, yeah. came out. So. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm surprised we actually haven't played that video given the maturity levels on this programme. We may as well show you the back page of the Sun. They're going with Kevin De Bruyne as well. D. Light. Uh, City star Kevin's on the verge of a new £62 million deal. There he is in the back. You've also got Siggy Stardust, which is a pretty good headline on the Everton game. Just before we move on to the Heralds, I just want to show you the back page of the Irish Daily Mail. Uh, the Bruyne jackpot is the headline there. How many years have they given him? What's the, um, my maths aren't great here. A six-year contract worth more than 200 grand a week, 200 grand in pounds. That is uh, the Bruyne jackpot. And it's something special. Uh, reads the headline on Everton. The also uh, the other story there, Michal Clifford writing that CPA blocked by a lack of democracy. That's uh, after their words yesterday on Congress. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it from the back of the Irish Daily Mail. Have you come up with your mathematical reasoning for Kevin De Bruyne yet? Yeah, so 62 million divided by six is uh, just over 10 million a year, which is where you get your 200 grand a week. It's all right. You should probably live off that. But is, is Aguero not on 350? Has he not been on 350 the whole time? I would, I'd be very, very surprised if he's not on more than 200 grand a week. Of course he is. I, I, I am actually surprised by the 200 grand number. I saw the 62 million and I'm like, oh, that has to be 300 at least. So 200 is actually a little bit stingy for Manchester City. Maybe it's the first offer and they're going to kind of up it a little bit. Yeah, you wouldn't want to, I mean, just tie everybody down now. Let them win three or four European Cups in a row and uh, presto, your job is done. You can do it on a wet Tuesday night. So you've done the sun. The Herald is the Arteta to Arsenal story, which um, I think we had already held up there, but I'll go for it again. Uh, Arteta target for Gunners, Wenger to hand reins to City coach while Moyes gives chance to Irish kid. Um, that's the League Cup tonight. Uh, a lot of kids going to be playing in those games, obviously. Um, the Arteta story is relatively interesting because it's hard to tell how good somebody is when they're number two to somebody like Guardiola. Um, there was always talk about Vieira, perhaps, because he was off getting some managerial experience for the Manchester City project in New York. But um, I don't know. Are they really going to give it to somebody who's like a number two? Well, no, but like th this is about the 20th story of a former Arsenal player who could potentially become Arsene Wenger's successor. None of them obviously have been true. Even the ones about like directors of football, like Mark Overmars last season, that was swiftly vetoed by Arsene Wenger. Yeah. If Wenger has a say in it, he'd, he might take Arteta in under his wing, but I don't think Arteta's going to leave for Arsenal for the exact same job that he has in Manchester City. So it's an interesting one. I'd, I'd be very surprised if there's any truth in it, particularly in the short term. Uh, we'll move on to the back page of the Star. They're going with another Arsenal story. They're going for David Luiz, according to the Star. Wenger's lining up 35 million euro Chelsea outcast. Uh, they're going for him in January, apparently. They've also got Rejuvenated. That's the headline going with Everton 3, Swansea 1. Rejuvenated. 
Yep, that, that, is, that is the headline. It, uh, you see, you take the first part of Rooney and you take the second part of Rejuvenated and you get Rejuvenated. So that yeah. is the logic behind that headline. And it really, 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 really works. Uh, so the mirror says uh, perhaps that we're going to see Zaha moving to City. City to go for Zaha. Wilfred Zaha, 40 million quid. Um, I mean, I presume Man United would be delighted with that, wouldn't they? It's like, oh, this guy's not good. Never read him anyway. Uh, Salah, I want to win a title with my Reds. Mohamed Salah has vowed to stay. He uh, is going to end the 28-year title drive pretty much on his own. Apparently, that's how that works. The last footballing story then on the back pages comes in the Racing Post Quarter Masters. Last eight rivals set to serve up a League Cup treat. That's Leicester versus Manchester City. It kicks off at 7.45 this evening. All right, coming up next, we're going to be joined by Kevin Coban, who was en route to West Brom against Arsenal. But on last night's news round, Joe asked Kev if Manchester City were the best-looking side he's seen. Here's what he has I to mean, say. You could argue maybe at this point, you could say maybe at this point, they're the most aesthetically pleasing uh, team oh, we've yeah. seen in the Premier League but the best is a trickier conversation I presume unless I'm missing anyone we're comparing them to the 98-99 Manchester United team the Invincibles and then maybe but not really Mourinho's Chelsea team at their best yeah well, they're certainly not playing uh, they're, well, they're certainly playing a different brand of football than Chelsea's team so if you're looking at it from as you say athlet- aesthetically pleasing side then Mourinho's side won't come in they did have spells where they were playing good stuff and mm. they were really good to watch but I think Consistently over this, what, what how many games are now? 18? 18 in? 17 in? 17. 17 in? I'm not going to ask him. No, it's more than 17, I think, isn't it? Uh, They've won Premier League at 17. Premier League 17 games, yeah. is, it? is that yeah. right? Yeah, I think, he's, I think Guardiola's all time record is 19 with Barcelona. Right. But I'm not really going to focus on aesthetically pleasing because I think a lot of us would agree on that. I'm going to say they're the best. But then you're in the trickier position of having to judge what's around them because you yeah. become the best by beating. Significantly, I don't disagree teams. with that. Man United, when they were flying, didn't necessarily have you know sides around them as well. That there were decent Arsenal and Liverpool challenging. sides that were challenging them year in and year out. Yeah, and I, Blackburn I suppose too, I well. United have got a decent side now that's challenging, but they've just kicked on to the next level. For me, oh. Oh. <laughs> he's back. <laughs> For me, um, yeah, no, I, I mean, it may be sort of going back to the aesthetically pleasing point, John. I appreciate that you've tried to move it away from that, but uh, they are the as close uh, this generation of a total football team as I've certainly seen like that sort of they're close on that late, late 80s Liverpool side the one that wasn't actually in Europe the one that like thrashed Forest 5 now at Anfield See, that, I, don't, that, I, I don't remember it I've got to say I don't really remember watching a lot of football then because there's no hmm. football on so I can't the re- only thing I can compare in my head is Premier League teams because when, when it first came on we were very hmm. relevant watching TV hmm. what was a 14, 15 when it first started to be played and that's all I can compare it with I can't compare it with that Liverpool side because I didn't see them enough Mm, that's an interesting point because um, obviously football didn't start when Sky started wall to wall coverage, but uh, wall to wall coverage did start when Sky started wall to wall coverage. So that is one of the reasons why um, there is so much spoken about the Premier League era. Way more games on TV, way more opportunity for us to see the quality and uh, the crapness of many teams from that era. Um, and that I think is very important when you start measuring these things off against each other. Yeah, I, I think we get like uh, more of an accurate representation of what a team actually is. Like, if you take the teams of the 70s, take the John Giles teams, for example, and you're like, what role did John Giles play? And you want to actually watch a full John Giles match. Well, you're going to have an FA Cup quarter final and a semi final and a final. But potentially, John Giles in the league played a different role to how he played in the Cup. Maybe he was just a cup player in that position. Uh, uh, you can suggest that to him sometime, Owen. Yeah. And uh, I look forward to the battering that you take as a result of suggesting the that. Verbal abuse. Football is football. Sorry, I forgot that vital point. Football is football. The ball is round, in home and away. It doesn't really matter. You still play the same way. There are no positions. European football. Come on. Come there, on. There are no tactics. Right. Hello, Kevin Kilban. How are you? Hi, Jay. How are you, Kim? Did yeah, very... suggest that John, ja- John Giles is a cup player? <laughs> Owen, Owen did suggest that. <laughs> that is not what I said. I, I said that there is a potential That's difference, and we would have exactly, just exactly what you said. Yeah, we would have just got the, the cup representation because they were all on TV, Kev. Um, and the allegation being ah, that he's right. big time Charlie. Also, just stitched in there for you know. <laughs> yeah, well, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'd still, I would still back John to beat. Oh, and in a fight. Oh, God, so would I. Completely. He was absolutely pulling me. <laughs> uh, I'm sitting here um, on TV, Kev, with uh, your book beside a, a, a wooden football. Tell me the story of the wooden football. Well, the wooden football is... Um, is it, well, all the signatures you can probably see on the ball are from our uh, 2002 World Cup squad. So everyone in the squad got one of those balls and 
got each and every one of the other squad members to sign the ball up for us. So that's just the the ball that was it was uh, one of the marketing or one of the um, one of the things out there in Japan and in Korea that were being given to supporters. But we managed to get one each, and we managed to get them all signed up. It, it's been gathering dust in my in my loft. So I spoke to Tommy and I said, "Look, I'll bring it in and and uh, and put it in the studio." Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. It, I would... it, it, it needs a proper plinth to go on, though. It, well, we've got, we've, got a, a... we've got an off-the-ball mug for it at the minute. I'm, I'm standing badly in front of the, uh, the thing here, trying to work out some of these names. Steve Staunton is very clear. He's number five. Um, I think we have the squad. Can we stick the squad up somewhere in there? Um, I'm trying to remember. What number were you? Oh, that's 11. It. Perfect. You're 11. Trying to find... Yeah, my, my, sign- my, my signature has actually changed since then as well. So I oh, yeah. I, I think, yeah, very much changed since then. You're more mature now, is that it? Yeah, I think so, yeah, that's it, exactly. So everybody signed one of these for each other? Yes, yeah, every, every one of the squad got one of those, yeah. And uh, was yeah, that so like it was, it, total motion at the end of the tournament, just after penalties that night out, you're all kind of drunk, yeah, sign this for me, like... Yeah, yeah it was a bit like that. I, I think we actually got those in Japan, actually, before we went to South Korea, so before we'd left Japan, it was merchandise that we'd seen around the place in... in um, in Japan, so we, we said, look, I tell you what, lads, but we'd all we'd all get one get one each, and then we, we just put them out after dinner one night, and every one of the lads signed them for each other, and then we just took them away with us. So that that was kind of how it went. So when we then went to, to South Korea, we probably already had them in the in the bag at that stage. Do you still get asked for autographs, Kev? Considering uh, selfies have completely taken over. One or two, one or two. Very rarely now, though. Yeah, you're right with that. It is, and usually if you'll get asked for an autograph, some uh, whether that would be a bit piece of merchandise, program, photograph, whatever it would be. A book. But off the back of it, there's always yeah, a book maybe yeah, or off the back of it, you'd always get a selfie. Yeah, a selfie just to just to hit it home that yeah, they'd actually <laughs> met you. Yeah, that's that's old. That's an old book. That that's an old book, Joe. You know that. I don't think it's a signed edition though. No, he didn't. He hasn't signed that's this one yet. Well, that's fresh from the box. I was I was given about 40, 50 copies, I think, from the publishers, and that's one of the. Again, it's gathering dust in the loft, so I just thought I'd, I'd bring it in. That was it. What else is in your loft, as a matter of interest? What did you actually keep thinking? Oh, I'm going to look back on this, and I wouldn't mind having it at some point. Yeah, do you know what? There's a lot. I, yeah, I, I was even looking through. You know, I've moved house quite a few times over the last few years, even now. So. Looking through it, I, I got uh, my, my captain's armband from when I captained the team. Um, the little uh, plaque that you, that you present to the opposition captain when I first captained under Brian against Croatia. Uh, you know, what do you call it? The little, uh, I can't remember what they're called now, top of my head now. Uh, the little, um, the monta, whatever, whatever. It's a little, a little, little, um, a little plaque sort of thing anyway. It's not really a plaque. Anyway, the one that you swap over with the other opposition captain, got one of them. I've got loads of stuff like that. I've got hundreds of shirts or dozens and dozens of shirts that I've that I've worn that, that one or two that I'd swapped over the years as well and, and things like that but it's just up in the basement yeah, up in the loft should I say Who would you swap with? I was going to ask you were you a swapper of shirts after every game? Did you always do that or was it like big games only? No I didn't swap I, I honestly I'm serious. it's only if you ask me I didn't swap I swapped, I swapped with Claude Puyel after the, the Spain game in 0-2 he asked me for my shirt, so I swapped him. Uh, Pierre van Hoydonk was another one that just that I'd saw the other week. Um, things like that, really. They're the only two maybe that, that stick out. A lot, a lot of the shirts that I, that I would have swapped over the years would have been just ones that I that, that would have asked me to swap, and that was it. I was never really a shirt swapper, really. Yeah, Puyol asked you to swap after the Spain game. Yeah, yeah. I, I like Puyol. I was like, he was definitely one of my favourite footballers because he kind of looked like he wasn't going to be good enough to be a part of that Barcelona team, and then he was yeah, probably he- one of the most important members of it. Yeah, he was. He played right back that day, actually, against me. So that's when he first broke into the Spain squad when he was playing at right back. And he was one of those players as well when you saw his name in the team sheet. He probably did, we didn't have as much uh, knowledge of, of the opposition as we would have had now as well. We certainly wouldn't have been watching a lot of the Barcelona Real Madrid games. So I didn't really know too much of him. Saw a few vi- a bit of video footage on him and things like that. And then obviously played up against him. But he was very physical to play against. But great competitor. So he, he, yeah. anyway, we swapped shirts after the game, so that was it. It was good. I was looking for the the names there and um, there's no number six. I just couldn't find a number six on it. Is there, is there a story around that or something? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's a long story, Jay. You, you, should, you, you know more than me about that. That's when off the ball started. So you know everything about that. <laughs> well, we, we knew one side of it anyway for a while. Uh, but then you get older and you learn that things aren't always as one-sided as they seem when you're a kid. Um, let's. We wanted to talk to you about Everton, actually. Uh, we've had this bit of a long-running debate here about how good or otherwise Big Sam is going to be for Everton. And I think that actually yeah. he's found the right club at the right time in his career and he could be here for quite a while. Yeah, I, 
I, I think when we'd spoken over the last few weeks, did anyone really believe that Everton were going to struggle this season across the board? Did ever th- anyone think they were really going to get relegated? I certainly didn't think that. But I think what they needed was a lift. I think Wayne Rooney had, had suggested last night, uh, post-match, that they would have lost that game last night against Swansea a few weeks ago. But what has happened now, there's been a change. There's a real positivity around the place. And, and Sam Allardyce brings that. No matter what, what whether people... Uh, um, a forum or not, he, he brings that real positivity to a, to a club and people that have worked under him would always say that and I think what he's done, I think he's gone into the club and I think he's he's just ma- he's just made sure the lads have got smiles on the face his day to day he's he's brought positivity, I think he knows even watching them last night, there's a real lack of pace in that team, I think they need pace, most definitely do, but what he will do, he'll get results with what he's got first and foremost and he, he'll build from that and I think now I think we'll see probably Everton probably build in January, then going forward so yeah, maybe in answer to your point, I think I think he's he's certainly at the right stage of his life, and I think I think it probably one of those things where certainly for the next couple of years, Everton will benefit from some Allardyce. Yeah, I think uh, the Sam Allardyce effect has been epitomised by Gilfie Sigurdsson because when we think of Gilfie Sigurdsson, we think of the set pieces and the skillful nature of his game, but in actual fact, the best part of Sigurdsson's game, in my view, is just how hard he works. Like he covered more ground yeah. than any other player in the Premier League last season, and it was just essentially getting that work ethic out of Sigurdsson, which was so. To run off defenders and go to running behind defenders, he needs play. He needs people doing that for him with his ability that he's got. But you're right; he's he does work on it. You even see now he's, he he played a lot there for Swansea last season. He played on the left hand side for Swansea under Paul Clement when he was starting to get the best out of him. But he was given a role from that left hand side where he was able to roam, come inside, and start to pick his passes out. I think he's starting to do that now at Everton. His goal last night was superb. Not no celebration again, Owen. I'm not too sure what you think of that one anyway. But um, he's he. He, 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 you're right, he's that. he does work extremely hard and I think he's well disciplined. He knows exactly his role within the side. He knows how to filter back into position quickly. And um, yeah, he does. He, he gives it everything. And, and that's what's, and, and again, it's something that Sam would be demanding from him day in, day out. Or Anotovic did on Saturday and like put up his hands like saying, I'm a hammer now. And Mark Hughes giving him a lot of abuse on the sideline for celebrating too hard against his former club. Or would he be more of a uh, man who kind of respects Gilfie Sigurdsson and respectful nature towards his former club? I, I personally think you've got to celebrate for your current club, personally, because I think it, it, they're paying your wages. They've they've gone out on a limb to get you. I don't necessarily buy into all this non-celebration against your old club. I don't mind Mark on Artwich doing what he did. I'm not being funny. They were abusing him. The Stoke City fans were abusing him for, through the through the whole of the game. And it's his chance once he scores to give them a little bit back, isn't it? Uh, that's the way that I would see it, really. And if 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 you give it, you have to be able to take it as well. As far as I'm concerned, I'm with Emmanuel Adebayor all the way. Streak the length of the yeah. pitch. Full knee slide in front of the fans, go, yeah, that's what you should do. That's what I think. Yeah, I can imagine you'd be up for that, yeah. Yeah, if I could just uh, manage to run the length of the pitch, I'd be grand. Here, the other thing was, uh, <laughs> there was a bit of bite about um, Everton last night as well, which is kind of, you know, it's, it, it's not a bad thing at all. It's a very good thing that um, when there was something, when there was a foot to be left in, you know you're going to be in a physical battle against this Everton team now. And they had a, a team of very... Noise was at its best. It was a team of men as well. And so I actually think that this is part of Everton's identity over the last 15 years when they have been good in the Premier League. Yeah, I think that's, honestly, I think that's Sam, Sam Alanash's biggest strength. He, he emboldens players. He, he he gives them responsibility. And I think now, Aaron Lennon is good. You mentioned Aaron Lennon there, Jay. I think Aaron Lennon last night, he was, he was the player that you felt was going to create something from Everton. He won the penalty for them. He, he, he was starting to get at defenders a little bit more. And I think Aaron, Aaron Lennon's that sort of player that needs a manager that's going to get into his head a little bit, really. Start making believe in himself. I think Idrissa Gaze is certainly the, the, the sort of player that, that you would like that's going to dig, he's going to bite. Snidling, all of a sudden now, he'd gone from, a, 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 by all accounts, not being a key figure now for Everton. That's the thing. Of course, he missed a penalty last night, but he's still producing. He, he provides assists. He's, he's scoring goals. And I think within that, Sam Allardyce will get the best out of the players from that, I don't know, that little bit of bite is what you're saying there, I think. I think that's what Sam Allardyce will be getting out of those players because he gives them that 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 little bit of belief that they can actually go out and they can actually play for each other. He, he brings that, Sam Allardyce brings a team together like probably, he doesn't get enough credit for anyway. He, he really brings a lot of togetherness with it. Within a, within a squad of players and that's why Everton are getting the results now yeah most definitely and all of a sudden they're really hard to stop because if a team sits deep against Everton as we saw with Rooney running from deep yesterday and sitting up I think the Sigurdsson goal like you can't give Rooney that amount of space but if you suddenly press up on Everton they've got the likes of Calvert-Lewin and Lennon who can run in behind you and cause you serious trouble yeah. all of a sudden Everton have a two-dimensional attack both options being very very dangerous 
Yeah, I mentioned before, perhaps there is a little bit of lack of pace. You take Calvert-Lewin, that Lennon, Lennon is probably not as quick as he probably once was, mm. but certainly Calvert-Lewin does give them that sort of energy. But you're right in saying that. I think if you drop off against Everton, I think you're playing into the hands because Sigurdsson and Rooney want that space. They don't necessarily want defenders tight up against them. They need that sort of space that they're going to be able to create off, off the back of that. I think the way to play against Everton is most definitely, I, I would feel personally, to try to go up and press against them. And you'd fancy yourself or you'd back your defenders if you've got quick defenders in your side to to, to stay with a Calvert-Lewin that's that's, uh, that's going to be in a position to maybe go, go in behind you. I think Everton last night, Everton looked good, larger down to the fact is that Swansea weren't great. And to be fair, I don't think Everton were even at the best last night. I don't think Everton have been at the best across the course of this season, but mm. Sam's finding a way to get the results, even when they're not playing well. I think one or two additions to the side in January, going forward towards the, the summer transfer window, I think Everton will be in a, a much stronger position come next season, yeah. Yeah, and they've obviously got uh, Coleman, hopefully, to come back into the team. And if Seamus Coleman re-emerges at some point towards the end of the season, with the same level of form that we know he's capable of, then I think Everton fans can look forward to next season with a lot of expectation and a lot of hope. We, our argument has basically been, I was making the point that I think Big Sam was a better manager for Everton right now than Sean Dyche was, and uh, Owen thinks that um, Big Sam has passed it and Sean Dyche is a genius, basically. <laughs> But sorry, your argument was that Sean Dyche should have gone in there. Sorry, you that was that was Owens. Way. Yeah, Owen, Owen basically thinks oh. Sean Dyche would have been a better manager in the longer term. I'm not. Uh, this is now. Okay, now that's fair all, enough. all joking aside. Than, uh, than Big Sam, and I actually think that that's yeah. wrong in this instance. I, I probably agree with you probably to an extent with, without wanting to sit on the fence a little bit here I probably agree with you both to an extent I think over a longer term I think Dyche would have been of course he would have been but I think if you're looking for that instant results that instant kick is what Everton need over a, a short term fix over, over a two year period I think Sam Allardyce is that perfect man but Sam Allardyce has really been I mean if you take Bolton out I suppose he's really been at a club more than more than a couple of seasons so I think, uh, I think realistically with, with Sam Allardyce, I don't think he's going to be around for the next five years. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think it would have been too big a, a job for Everton to get rid of, to, or to take Sean Dyche, sorry, away from Burnley with all his staff. Sean Dyche wanted every member of his staff to go in, so it would have been a massive upturn of, of, of staff or, or a changeover of staff at Everton. And that's what... I believe they couldn't afford or they couldn't change around because there's too many there's too many members of staff that's really integral to, to the club or an integral part of that club for such a long time. And I don't think that's what Bill Kenwright or Fahad Mashiri wanted to do. They wanted to keep the the nucleus of that of that uh, club structure in place. And I, I'd probably agree with that as well because there's a lot of people that's been ingrained in that club for, for a hell of a long time. Maybe some might argue that, it, that there's a change needed, I don't know. But I, personally, I'd, I'd feel as though that Everton is, is what it is for the people that's around that club. And I think Sean Dyche wanted to change too much and I think that's the reason why he, he actually wasn't appointed in the end. I think all the more reason why I actually think Big Sam is perfect for them right now. And I think that he could actually be there a bit longer than he has been at other clubs. The other clubs that he's gone into have all been in one way or another a basket case and that was ultimately why he ended up getting the job this isn't a club that's a basket case it's a club that was temporarily going through a dip of form because they'd, they'd hired the wrong manager basically Koeman was the wrong manager for Everton and I actually think that he could stay there a number of seasons and that the the ceiling for his achievement there is you know competing in the Europa League and having a realistic shout of winning that tournament which isn't ridiculous if you think of the money that they have the heritage they have and the playing squad that they have. Yeah, of course. I, I think the ultimate goal, and I know that people maybe laughed at Roberto Martinez when he said it a few seasons ago, is to try to breach the top four again. It's, it has been done before, yes, but they have to. They have to at least try to get to that sort of level. It will be difficult. It'll be massively difficult for them. I think we all know that with the money that is in there. But you suggested there now, Jay. You're right. There is a lot more money around the club now than there ever was. Everton are paying. Huge, huge wages now. Their wage bill has gone through the roof over the last four or five years. So they're able to now attract the, the, the calibre of players that, that, that they probably couldn't attract before. They're able to maybe pay the fees that they couldn't pay before. They're on a different playing field. So they have to seriously be looking at trying to get in, first of all, get into the top six, top four. And as you say, perhaps go for a Euro play, go and try and win a trophy. Because it's been too long now since Everton have won a trophy. I think it's 95 now since they won that, that FA Cup. I think most Evertonians would want to have a good crack at the FA Cup this season now. Last question, uh, you're heading obviously to a game tonight, it's the West Brom game, is it? Uh, no, West Ham. West Ham. Uh, also, West Ham, West Ham also West Ham this evening, yeah. yeah. What are you expecting? Um, I think there'll be a lot of changes for Arsenal. I think uh, I, I, I mean, West, West Ham after, the, after beating Spurs in the last round where they had a really, really good uh, almost safe Slavin Bilic, his, his job, that result. So. I, 
I don't know. I, I think if West Ham carry on the way that they've been playing, they had a good result against Arsenal in the in the last week or two. So I think they've got a good chance. If if Arsenal do make the changes that I envisage, I, I think West Ham have got a good chance tonight. Kev, okay, safe flight, enjoy. Thanks a million for joining us and cheers. Take it to the easy. Ball. Cheers, lads. It's pretty pretty special. It is. Uh, so where's where's that going to sit? Is that going to be kind of an over the shoulder kind of thing? Is it, is it going to get leave pride it, of place over leave it on the desk? These belts or Connor's boots? You certainly can't move that chicken that's usually hanging up over my shoulder. It seems to have been uh, kind of moved from its usual spot in the basket. But uh, So that's not, not moving. But maybe the, the Wilson ball over your head that might be replaced by the 2002 ball. It's a shame it's missing Keno's signature. They should have actually gone to his house and asked him. We should get him to sign it, do we? Like, hey, by the way, there was this thing that happened in 2002. You weren't there, but is there any chance you'd sign it? Yeah, that would, that would multiply the value or else massively decrease the value of this piece of memorabilia. Depends. Dep- depends who you ask, I guess. Um, yeah, 17... I actually can't make out very many of these names. That's why we did print off the um, the squad list a little bit earlier on, so we could try and work out who they all were. But um, I don't. I guess you, I can't read signatures. Yeah, I, f- I found an old autograph book uh, of mine at home recently, and it was from uh, like Car Savine in two thousand when Kerry won the All Ireland. I, I can make out Declan O'Keefe's name. The rest of them, I just yeah. can't. And I, I, I often wonder, like, since autographs have gone completely out of fashion, obviously players aren't working on them anymore. They don't like. I presume it was kind of like pride that it was like, oh, you can't recognise my name. My autograph is amazing. Yeah. My writing is so artistic. You can't understand my name whatsoever. But I wonder nowadays, is it just like they write your name in print? So it's that like, you, you do actually know. Like, if Kevin yeah. was signing an autograph, he'd just be writing like a, a kid writes or something like that. <laughs> I, I presume the artistic nature of that's completely gone. Uh, all right, keep your comments rolling in. Five three one. Sorry, uh, at uh, off the wall on Twitter. <laughs> you can get us facebook.com forward slash off the wall. Now, last night, John Callahan had some very stark words about head injuries in rugby. This was uh, in the aftermath, of course, of Johnny Sexton being taken off after just two minutes of the game against Exeter at the weekend with a HIA. Here's what Donica had to say. So, Sean Cronin lost a front tooth and hurt himself. Uh, ostensibly, Sexton hurt himself with the tackle. And it was a really bad uh, blow to the head, although Leo Cullen said afterwards he was chatting away to Exeter players in the corridor afterwards, so they're hopeful it's not too serious. But mm-hmm. the way Cronin charged out so high, the way Sexton went so high, I mean, you're the player here, Dunica, but that, it strikes me as asking for trouble. Yeah, well, the, the big thing, Joe, is line speed at the moment. So, And uh, you made the point earlier on that... Um, you know, Robbie kept knocking the ball up in midfield. That's because he's no other option. The, the press from the defensive line is so aggressive at the moment that you're getting, uh, to quote Stephen Ferris, you're getting man and ball with every, with every pass. Mm. And uh, it is hard to break down. And look, I'll be honest with you, when it comes to collision, you try to find any um, hard area to take it into contact. So if it's your head, your shoulder, your elbows, your knees, you... You, you you try to nearly protect your body. I don't know. You, it just it's something you tend to do on the carries, and we're definitely having an awful lot of headshots at the moment. And uh, it's probably something like I said. We've chatted about this often and off there. Between maybe route changes or something, something needs to happen because I think we're just we're having too many HIA. Mm. It it's just it it's it's an awful blight on the game. Yeah. All right, this is uh, an interesting... Uh, obviously, that was pretty interesting as well. You can get the full stuff available on podcast. But uh, a, uh, a tweet coming in from Marco Dolly. Uh, with Offaly GAA ending Nigel Dunn's dual, players, um, dual player ambitions and uh, the Dublin hurlers without their best available, is it not time for the GAA to have winter football and summer hurling? Well, how come football is one that's relegated to the winter? Well, because, you know, I mean, obviously it's a far less skillful game. Yeah, like it's impacted less by winter, but it still gets impacted... How? Like, what, how? Yeah. Well, like you use, you lose the whole kind of summer festival feel around championship games. That's a, key, can, that's a key, can, key component. You could finish it on the June bank holiday weekend. Okay, so you get the, the finals in Crow Park, and like that's a good weekend. Where uh, you you maybe, get maybe May is decent. Quarterfinals in Crow Crow. Like in May. Okay, I, I go uh, last year and the year before. I've gone to pretty much all the league games, and I, I can tell you this, Jar, it's a much more miserable experience than going to championship games. Yeah, uh, my first league game last year was in Mayo in Castle Bar, and that was freezing. It's just so cold, like all, all you like driving you, home in the ice. You lose concentration of the game sometimes. You are so cold. Like I think Mayo, I think Monaghan won. I'm not sure. 
pretty sure they did, but I'm not. I couldn't fully remember. But you can remember. You can remember the cold. You can probably still feel the cold. That's what you remember from those games. It'd be terrible to have like really meaningful championship football in the middle of those. But you don't have it in January. Have it, have the championship run off over. I mean, obviously this is never going to happen, so it's complete <laughs> fantasy. But like um, April, May, June. Well, the counter argument is you look at the NFL and the atmosphere is almost heightened in the likes of Minnesota and Buffalo when the snow starts falling. Yeah. But then again, those fans are just completely mental. So yeah. They're a, bit, they're a bit harder than us. Yeah, I don't know about them. I don't know about playing in those conditions. Maybe if you put a roof on all of our stadiums and played on uh, artificial turf. Yeah, that's realistic. You know, I mean, there's been plenty of white elephants before. Uh, Go away, GAA, a story in the papers today, are going to lose two million for um, a piece of land they bought in Athen Rye. Uh, at the height of the boom when they were going to have like a hurling centre of excellence there. Now they've realised that they can have both a hurling and a football centre of excellence, um, whatever the facilities they're using in Clarence Bridge. And the GAA had to take over the loan centrally and go away like, oh, we have a plan for it, all right. The plan is to let uh, Croke Park look after it centrally. Croke Park have had to bail out so many um, of the individual counties that you do wonder sometimes about the proficiency of various county boards, and I'm not speaking specifically about the uh, Galway situation, but various county boards to actually run their uh, ship properly and you know maybe a fully centralised structure that imposes everything. Mm. It's also never going to happen, it's a complete fantasy. It seems like that comes down to a lot of things. You talk about fixtures, you talk about stadiums, you talk about grounds. Everything seems it would be a lot better if there was one centralised body who looked after everything. Uh, of course it kind of comes down, like I could be accused of a communist for suggesting uh, such a thing that oh no there's no way that uh, the GA should look after everything, each county to their own, they should work for their own and if they make profit off it then so be it and if they fail miserably then so be it as well. But uh, I, uh, you know what, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind seeing a little bit of a leaning towards these socialist ideals in the GAA. Let's, let's have a bit more control from uh, centralised bodies, what I say. Yeah, although that's to make more money and to manage the money properly. Is that, is that yeah, but I, I would, a I would, capitalist point? I, I would, yeah, that, that is true as well, but <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is capitalism at the top and then they're going to share out all the money uh, amongst the counties. So at the local level... Capitalism, it's capitalism. in the streets, socialism in the sheets, is that's that it? That's it. <laughs> wow, I've never heard that one before, but let's go for it. That's my new mantra. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, Darren O'Mahony says on Doping and Sport on Facebook, uh, there's always going to be drugs and athletics and cycling, too much money in it for there not to be. I'd say the next big drug scandal will come from soccer or rugby. The rewards in those sports are far too big for people not to be doping. Precisely the point. It's not just um, that the doping happens in athletics and cycling, it's that the other sports have decided that they don't want to find out about it. That they're, Clearly, there has been endemic doping in football all the way back to uh, the Germans in 1954, there were vials found in the changing room after they had this miraculous comeback against the marvellous Magyars, the Hungarian team of Ferenc Puskas. But like, it's one of the most important moments in German history, not just German football, that they have this amazing comeback in the, in the final. So that's the first proper sign of any doping scandal. And then you just follow that through and think there was clearly doping in European football, like in, well in advance of it arriving in England. And it has clearly arrived in England over the last decade or so. Yeah, you, you follow the paths of certain doctors and it leads to big smoking guns in other sports, but then you follow the leads into football in other sports, then there is no smoking gun. So uh, you, you do have to wonder about uh, have you actually seen the end of these stories. Uh, CJ Stander, a point from Daniel Casey, who says he's a huge Munster fan, but if that money is right, CJ is dead right to go and I wouldn't hold it against him. 840 grand was the figure that the examiner have on their front page this morning, which um, it's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. It's and if he if he turns it down, I hope Munster fans and the IRFU appreciate what he's doing. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure is this going to be the end of the story though. Will Altrad come back with a million? I suspect he might. Just to be the first one to have, like, well, somebody's already on a million. Charles Pietau is on a million next mm. year. Yeah, I don't know, maybe to be the first in France. All right, let's talk more about um, some sports books. I know, obviously, it's getting a bit late for people and uh, you're all a bit desperate for Christmas presents. We have the absolute solution for you coming your way. It's every single sports book long listed for the Air Sport Book of the Year Awards. That's uh, going to be our prize to give away on the show tomorrow. In the meantime, here's a bit of a recommendation for you. Here's Niall Kelly on Air Sports Book of the Year. Philly McMahon of the choice. I suppose without giving away the whole narrative and the whole arc of Philly's story like yeah. John found himself growing up in Ballymoan at a time when heroin was so prevalent and ended up taking his first hit of heroin who was just 14 years old like it's wow. like and I remember there were a few I obviously went in knowing a, l a bit of Philly's story from the interviews he's given over the past few years he's obviously been quite open about John's relationship and I remember 
the first time he told me that and like it was genuinely without exaggeration a moment that would absolutely hit you and stop you in your tracks and think how is that even yeah like thinking of what I was doing at 14 or like young cousins I have of around that age you know second year in, in secondary school or whatever it is and it, it does it does just hit you in your tracks and I think what John summed it up nicely what Philly said the other day about it being the right thing to do the one word like people have very generously used words like bravery and honesty and in their critique of the book the one word that I would use to describe Philly is his generosity and the generosity of him and his family to revisit all of this and go to a place that's still in a, not, a lot of respects like John only passed away in 2012 a lot of respects some very raw emotion for Philly himself a lot of emotions that he never really processed until he sat down to do this book and do all of that in the hope of sharing their story so that somebody else might not have to go through what they went through or that somebody else might have a better understanding of how to deal with that and for me that was like that was the real privilege of being able to work with him on it okay. can I add to, yeah. to, find, add find, to that final find, word find, on this yeah. uh, any, any person who has been in any way touched by addiction will be really really blown away by this book and they will Philly clearly knew when he was starting out that he was going to write something that was going to have an impact on people and he was very deliberate clearly in, in doing that and if you have if anyone has been touched in any way by addiction in, in a family or friend circle this book will will answer questions for them that they may have been carrying around for you know for a long time I, I really believe that yeah I think that's the core of it John I think it's, it's not just one of the sports books of the year it's one of the books that you yeah. like it shouldn't be ghettoized and people think no I'm done with sports books all right, it's time for us to turn boxing, and I'm delighted to say we're talking about this. It's an astonishing new work. It's simply titled Ali, A Life, and uh, it's anything but simple in terms of the vast scale of work that clearly went into it, but also of the achievement, I guess, in capturing the uh, full 360 degrees of Muhammad Ali's life. And um, I'm delighted to say Jonathan Ike is on Skype for us. Uh, Jonathan, congratulations. It's a, It really is a, an astonishing feat to be able to capture a life as as big and as well known publicly as uh, Muhammad Ali's and yet to still be capable of uncovering new aspects of it. Um, so congratulations. Thank you, appreciate it. It was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun too. Yeah, so one of the things that we were talking about in the office that was kind of um, the certainly one of the most interesting uh, rhythms that is in the book is the women in Muhammad Ali's life and uh, it turns out there were a lot of them. Yeah, there were a lot. I would hate to have to try to estimate how many. Um, you know, he was married four times, and um, most of those wives put up with uh, a lot of mistresses and knew about it um, as they were going through the, their marriages. It was something that they they had to tolerate or were expected to tolerate and, and did. Um, Ali was, was terrible, um, ran around with women all the time, often um, had his wives book hotel rooms for his mistresses, and would sleep with uh, with prostitutes sometimes right before his fights, even you know hours before his fights. It seems as if, in looking at this years later and, and um, reflecting on their role in it, and uh, I guess uh, maybe their role in it is, is their understanding of what that relationship was like. Some of them kind of seem to accept that, and others feel like they were taken for granted and. Uh, actually didn't fully appreciate what was going on at the time. Yeah, I think it was a combination of those things. They they knew what was going on, and they felt like for a while they were able to accept it. They felt like they were the ones who counted that, that these other women were just sort of passing fancies for Ali and that he really needed his wives and, and counted on them to, to be there for him. And they were young, and they were immature, and they thought that um, you know they could put up with it. And... In the end, it, it became too much to bear for, for his uh, second and third wives, uh, the ones I interviewed the most, um, Belinda and uh, Veronica. They felt like they just were being taken advantage of after a while, that uh, there was no end to it, that the women, the, uh, the mistresses just kept coming and coming, and they, they couldn't take it anymore after a while. What kind of life do those women lead after they break up with Muhammad Ali because I guess that's the other picture of this it's a, it, as I said it's a full 360 degrees of, of what Ali's life is like how was life like for them? 
Um, you know, it, it varied. They um, they got nice settlements in the divorce. They received a fair bit of money, um, but his second wife ended up um, pretty much burning through all that money and and struggled for a while. She was cleaning homes um, in Ali's own neighborhood for a while. She was working as a housekeeper. Um, his third wife ended up going back to school and 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 becoming a psychologist and doing pretty well for herself. They they all had kids of Ali's to take care of, and they. Um, they looked after those kids and, and did a good job as parents, as best I can tell. And um, it was a difficult life, though. And I think adjusting to life after marriage to Ali was was not easy. You know, you, uh, you go from being the center of the universe, um, uh, you know, married to the most famous man on earth. It's hard to get back to, uh, to adjust to a normal life after that. There's one aspect, I guess, that we should really focus on. We, can, we can't leave this discussion of the women in Ali's life without reflecting on it properly. Um, Muhammad Ali was violent towards the women in his life at various occasions. I know certainly in the Hauser biography there would have been a reference maybe once, but it seemed like that was kind of a, an event that was out of time. Um, here you get a, a complete picture that this was a fairly regular occurrence. I don't know that I would say it was a regular occurrence, but it did happen more than once. Um, his second wife told me of a couple of instances where um, where where she was hit, and um, third wife Veronica told me that um, she was not surprised to hear that that Ali could, especially before fights, uh, could become very um, uptight and and would lash out at the women around him. Um, it was definitely something that was hard for me to uh, to hear, given that you know I grew up as a big fan of this guy, and, and that behavior was um, was really difficult for me to believe and to accept. But it's uh, it's out there; it's part of what uh, these women testify to, and and we have to um, we you know we have to assume that they're telling the truth. Jonathan, we can speak about the adultery that occurs in Ali's marriages, but then there's the element of manipulation as well. You've already alluded to the whole idea of booking hotel rooms and things like that. It didn't seem just like something that Ali did out of convenience. It seemed he got some sort of enjoyment out of that, about having control of his partner, because you quote him in the first divorce proceedings after his first marriage ends, and he says he would like to marry a 17 or an 18-year-old girl next, somebody that he can mould into his way of thinking. He essentially gets that despite a pretty stubborn start with Belinda in his second relationship or his second real relationship. And it seems that this is something in a very perverse way that Ali really enjoyed having this control over these women. Yeah, that was um, interesting and, and troubling. And I think you have to look at some of the context. You know, he, he comes from an abusive household where his father was very domineering and, and, and um, drank heavily and beat his wife. And then he gets involved with the Nation of Islam, which has this attitude that men are superior to women and, and women are meant just to serve their their spouses and even says that you know men can have more than one wife uh, even though American custom frowns on that American law frowns on that uh, the nation of Islam sort of quietly says that um, it's okay to have your own harem and Ali becomes a part of this culture um, and and um, and seems to accept the idea or believe that he can be um, controlling of these women in that way, and that that he you know in, and marries a very young woman in part for that reason that he wants to be in command. And um, you know, for a guy who's the heavyweight champion of the world, who's so big and strong, he shouldn't need to, um, to 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 control women that way. But he has a hard time accepting them as his equal, I guess. Once you get four hundred pages into the book, it's chapter forty three, and it's an incredible few paragraphs here, you essentially just so concisely list off all these events that happen in Ali's life, regardless of what time these happen, like uh, women coming to the door of Ali's house saying that they're the mother of his children, and this happens a number of times. What I'll question, though, is the a story about Tamika Williams claiming she began an affair with Ali uh, in 75 and soon after had his son. Williams then later sued Ali for sexual assault, alleging that she had only been 12 when the relationship started. But of course, this Chatuda limitations kind of limited any of that actually getting to court or Ali being pressed with charges here. Like, that's an incredibly disturbing thing and not something that I'd come across before. No, you know, it was reported a little bit at the time when the suit was filed here in the United States. Um, a few publications mentioned it, but then the, uh, the the case was dismissed, as you said, for statute of limitations, so it was never fully explored. And uh, Tamika Williams is now deceased, so I was not able to interview her. And um, we don't know for certain uh, whether the child in question really was Ali's. Um, Ali's third wife, Veronica, had her doubts about it. Um, 
when I interviewed her, she said she knew about Tamika. She knew that she was somebody who hung around the camp a lot and uh, may have slept with a number of people in Ali's entourage. Um, but she said she did not believe that the child was Ali's. Nevertheless, if Ali was uh, involved with a girl um, uh, who was a minor, that um, is, you know is, is obviously beyond disturbing. It's uh, it's criminal, and uh, we just um, you know it's a, it's a, it's it raises very un, un, unsightly questions. When you you talk about some of those questions, um, there's also FBI files that maybe have not been published before as well. How, how much of this was the FBI aware of, or were they specifically really interested in his links with the Nation of Islam and, and less his, his extracurricular activities? The FBI did not seem at all interested in his extracurriculars. You know, they used the, F, the FBI used uh, those kinds of uh, sexual um, allegations to try to take down people like Martin Luther King Jr., where they were trying to disgrace uh, King uh, and they, they, they made tapes of his bedroom activities. But with Ali, they did not see him as a threat to democracy. They weren't really that paranoid about Ali, and they weren't looking to discredit Ali. They were mostly interested in the Nation of Islam, and uh, they, were, you know, they were concerned about people like Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad. So they were keeping tabs on Ali for that reason, mostly. Um, they were also concerned that, uh, during his years of opposing the draft in Vietnam that um, if he were allowed to... Um, to continue saying these things that it might make recruiting more difficult for the military. But Ali was not um, spied on with that same level of intensity that, um, that other civil rights leaders were. That comes across in the papers as you kind of study them and, and read through them and kind of get access to, to this stuff. Again, I guess that, that gives us that better sense maybe than we've had before of, of where his role was at the time and how he catapults himself from there to being the person who is considered the most famous and most successful and the greatest of them all in American culture at the end of the 20th century. It is a remarkable transformation. Yeah, it's stunning to think that somebody who was, you know, one of the most despised men in America in the 1960s can go to becoming this saint who, um, you know, seems to have almost universal acclaim and, and we all seem to want to um, see the best in him and, and see ourselves in him. He becomes, um, you know, this turnaround that he makes is, is fascinating. And it, it, you know, some of it is, occurs just because he's 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 struck with this illness and he's silenced, and and we uh, we feel bad for him. I think that's a big part of it. Another piece of uh, FBI information, Jonathan, is regarding one of Ali's former bodyguards, uh, Amir, who was murdered in 1965. So, before the beating that led to his death, Amir told the FBI that Ali was getting tired of the numerous donations the Nation of Islam expected him to make. And according to one FBI memo, as you reveal in the book. Uh, Amir told Ali he was foolish to let the nation of Islam milk him. Now, remembering that this is in 1965, this is quite big information because it's fairly well known anyway into the 1970s. Ali becomes a more rounded person. He isn't this rebel. He isn't as devout, uh, we'll say, to the nation of Islam, certainly after Elijah Muhammad's death, as he had been in the 1960s. So to hear this coming from Ali in 1965, as early as that, is very, very interesting. And I'm just wondering, is, is this consistent with anything else, or, or is it merely this bodyguard who, who was the sole uh, holder of this information? Well, there are suggestions that Ali had um, concerns about the nation of Islam, that he was afraid that if he ever left, um, he might be killed the same way Malcolm X was, was killed. Um, after falling into a uh, you know, bad way with Elijah Muhammad. So, um, you know, Ali was a complicated guy. He was incredibly loyal to Elijah Muhammad. He, he believed that Elijah Muhammad was a prophet of God. He was willing to turn his back on, Elijah Muhammad, on uh, Malcolm X um, at a time when maybe he could have saved Malcolm's life. He, you know, he chose not to. Um, so it's hard to know how much of that was motivated by his true belief in Elijah Muhammad and how much of it was motivated by fear. I mean, a lot of us operate out of fear that God will will strike us down um, if we if we uh, if we sin or if we disobey His commandments. And Ali truly believed that um, Elijah Muhammad was a messenger of God. So, you know, these these things were really um, were really tricky to 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 delineate and to just know exactly what he was thinking. But it was complicated, and he was um, you know uh, he, he certainly had some doubts and some worries about about the nation of Islam. Those doubts, right, that seems to be the thing that has carried down through the years across history that in some ways 
he was a victim of that arrangement. But what was he getting out of it? What, what did this man who clearly wanted to be a part of that organization and yet as early as the mid 60s was resenting the amount of money that he had to give them, what did he feel like he was actually getting from that relationship? Was it s simply a, a pathway to God? Yeah, I think some of it was that he believed that this was a pathway to God, that this gave him an organizing set of principles in his life, just like a lot of people who, who find that religion gives them a sense of order, a, a, a way to live. The Nation of Islam suggested a way to live that, you know, if, if you, uh, you didn't have to rely on the white man to, um, to make the rules, you didn't have to wait for the white man to, to give you um, a fair shot in, in this country, that you could fight for your own way of doing things. And eventually the Nation of Islam said that God would grant black people their own nation, like you know they would have their, their land to themselves and they wouldn't have to uh, be a part of, of uh, white society anymore. So, so I think that a big part of it was that it gave him a set of operating principles in life. And, um, and, and it also, you know, gave him this identity of the, of the rebel. It just said, you know, he could be an outsider. He didn't have to be what people wanted him to be. He didn't have to be, um, you know, another Joe Lewis who just followed the rules. He, um, he saw in this a chance to rebel. And does he use that? Like, is, it, is that a, a calculation on his part or is it just a, is it a more emotive thing? I think it's emotive. I don't think he's doing it um, in, in some way to boost his career or to make himself more famous. I think he believes that this is a way to make sense of life. And, you know, he, he struggles because he, he wants to be famous, but he also wants to, you know, punch white society in the face and say, you know, uh, I don't have to live the way you tell me to live anymore. So the Nation of Islam gives him a way to do that. At the same time as that, though, Jonathan, you kind of very well illustrated in the book that he also wanted to be very, very famous. And with that comes acceptance. And I think there's a point in his career, as I kind of alluded to a little bit earlier on, that he realizes that being a little bit more kind to white society is what he needs to be if he wants to be as famous as he desires. And that point does arrive. And it's then we see this conflict between the guy he wants to rebel and the guy he wants to be extremely famous. Yeah, it's fascinating because uh, when he comes back after his um, his exile from boxing in the 1970s, he, he seems to just want to be a celebrity. He doesn't talk about race very much anymore. He doesn't talk as much about the Nation of Islam. He starts doing television commercials for all kinds of products. He endorses his own line of uh, cologne and and, uh, and and linens for the bed and, and hamburgers. So... It's it's bizarre that a guy who wanted to be this this anti-establishment crusader all of a sudden also wants to endorse hamburgers, and and that's what makes Ali so fascinating. He wants to be the rebel, he wants to be the thorn in the side, and he wants to be loved, and those things are at war within him. If you could like turn time around and Muhammad Ali of say 1965 at Muhammad Ali of 1975, what would they say to one another in the trash talk beforehand? <laughs> I think the 1975 uh, version would be called an Uncle Tom yeah. by the 1965 version. You know, Ali would have said, "You're just a sellout. You're just out there um, making money. You're the white man's pawn. You're, you're, you know, you and Howard Cosell should go get married." You know, he'd he'd be uh, he'd be brutal. Uh, 65 Ali would uh, would uh, would would uh, tear apart the 75 Ali, tear him apart in the ring too. And yet, it's a 75 one who ends up being the platform for him to become so beloved by society. I wonder if maybe the 65 one has a bit of a point. Yeah, I think you can make that case because the 75 um, Ali is the one who's um, hamming it up with uh, with Johnny Carson and Howard Cosell and um, has you know kind of forgotten about his principles. He's no longer saying that white people will ne can never be trusted. He's saying, um, you know, white men can help my career. So it's... Uh, you know, you could call him a sellout or you could say that he just matured and mellowed, I guess. And understands the way of the world as well. There's obviously also um, clear details about the degenerative brain issues that he had and, and how early on in his career that people close to him, the doctors uh, in his camp, were beginning to notice that there was already an issue. And I think knowing everything we know now and knowing how the story ends for Muhammad Ali, that bit is incredibly poignant. 
Yeah, that was disturbing for me. You know, when I first interviewed um, Ferdy Pacheco, who was his ring doctor, Pacheco said that he thought he saw signs of brain damage as early as 1971. And I couldn't believe it. I thought he was mixed up, that he was, you know, mistaken about that. But I think he was right. I went back and, and first of all, I counted all the punches that struck Ali over the course of his career. And you can see that he starts getting hit a lot more in the 70s than he did in the 60s. And then I worked with scientists to study his speech rate. And you can see that his, his voice is starting to slow down, that he's starting to show signs of cognitive damage as early as 1970, 71. So um, it does appear that, um, that the punches were, were taking their toll and, and causing damage a lot sooner than than people thought. Because even if you look back at Ali's earlier work and his own quotes that you quote here, like even after the Doug Jones fight, he's complaining about headaches and he says, maybe if we make enough personal appearances, we don't have to fight so much and get banged around. So it seems from even at that early point in his life, he's very aware that there is this very real danger in his career. And then you illustrate that sliding doors moment when Warner Brothers offer him uh, a big uh, paycheck for I think Heaven Can Wait and Warren Beatty ends up casting himself in the role instead. It is a huge success. And as I say, it's this sliding doors moment and who knows what would have happened if he had taken that role. And most importantly, who knows how much longer Ali would have lived and certainly without Parkinson's symptoms. That's right. You know, he had lots of chances to get out. And, and I think every boxer knows that you're running a huge risk. You know, one punch can 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 leave you brain damaged. One punch can kill. Um, but he continued to fight because it was easy money or he thought it was easy money. Obviously, he paid a huge price for that money that he earned in the ring. You made the point earlier on about how anxious society has been to paint him as an angel after he gets injured and um, or after he gets his disease and, and that kind of sense that everything up to that point in some ways, um, I, I want to use the word whitewash, it, it feels somehow like it uh, has racial implications, but that actually that's what society really, that's the issue here in, in the Ali story is that we, we haven't had this full sense of there were a lot of awful things that happened in Muhammad Ali's life, he's a product of his environments, and he was not immune from that environment. Uh, and to fully appreciate his life or to understand his life, you really have to have all the details and, and understand that he is a complicated individual. That's right. You know, um, it's interesting to see what happens to Ali after he lights the Olympic torch in 1996, uh, because he's almost um, remade by the American society. For the for much of the 80s and 90s, Ali kind of disappeared. He, he wasn't the, the great hero. He was somebody you could hire for a few thousand dollars to sit at a trade show or come to your car dealership and sign autographs. And and he was damaged. He was, you know, he didn't look good on TV and, and he was he didn't like to appear on TV. But then when he lit that Olympic torch in 1996 in Atlanta, um, it was as if the world rediscovered him, forgave him for everything he had done and just wanted to hug him but the reason that we wanted to hug him was because he was weak and he was and, and he was he was silent and he was he was harmless um, but we need to remember that Ali was was not harmless uh, the reason he's important is because he was dangerous and he was complicated we shouldn't turn him into some kind of an angel one of the, the final things here, Jonathan, just in terms of the comparisons you make with Ali, the Bob Dylan reference is very appropriate, really, because essentially Muhammad Ali and Bob Dylan are both products of the 1960s, but at the same time, they don't properly fit in until people from the 1960s are living their lives in the 1970s. I think the reference you make is that people would still dress up like hippies and go to the Bob Dylan gigs, but then the next morning they'd go back to their nine-to-five desk job. And it kind of feels to me that the 1970s was a decade that Muhammad Ali will kind of feel at home in the most. This is exactly where he belonged in history. Yes, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. You know, for so many of those great rebels who had to um, put their tie-dye T-shirts away and go out and, and, and you know, they were only 20-something when they, when they made their mark in the 60s, um, what do you do after that? How do you have a second act? How do you live the rest of your life as an adult without completely selling out the principles that, that made you famous and that you cared about the most in the 60s? And I think that... You know, Dylan uh, and Ali and all the great um, rebels of the 60s had to struggle with that. What do you do when you grow up? How do you, you know, they mocked middle age. They said that they would never want to even be 40 years old. So how do you go on with your life? And Ali became an entertainer after that.
sorry, my mic was off there. That was uh, Jonathan Eig there speaking to myself and Jerry a couple of weeks ago uh, about Ali a Life. That's the name of his new book, an unbelievably comprehensive study of the life of Muhammad Ali and a couple of other things about his head injuries, his philandering, which are particularly interesting and exclusive to this book. It's one of the sports books of the year and we would highly recommend it. You will be able to get that full U uh, YouTube video uh, in the next couple of hours. You'll also be able to watch back our interview with Kevin Kilban speaking a little bit more about Saipan. There's actually some new stuff, we think, in that interview that you might not have heard before. He's also talking about that Everton result last night. Ten points from a possible 12 under Big Sam at this point. We are back tomorrow morning at 7.45am on Periscope via Twitter and on YouTube and on Facebook, of course. Off the ball on News Talk is live this evening from 7 o'clock. Uh, you'll get that on newstalk.com or on 106 to 108 on your radio. As I say, we'll chat to you tomorrow morning. Good luck.